I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with John Ratchford. John, since 1993, has been the owner and operator of Ratchford Photographic Studio. Today, I want to find out from John, how has photography changed over the last three decades? But also, how has it remained the same? Join me today in my conversation with John Ratchford. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Mr. John Ratchford. Good day, fine sir. It's nice to be with you, Brian. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. I think we have to give a shout out to Frankie McDonald for hooking us yes. up. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I do appreciate your time and coming on here. Would you do me a favor and tell us what industry you're in? And a lot of people I... that know you give you obviously know what you're in. Uh, sure. what you're up, but what you're up to nowadays? Well, I have been a photographer, uh, like a studio photographer, does, you know, portrait work, you know, everything from graduation to weddings to some model work uh, with a program I have, and a little bit of commercial. And I have been, I opened my first studio in 1988 when I was 21. So I've been at this literally all my life. That's, that's pretty, pretty amazing. I have a question about that later. John, okay. will, will you bring us back though? So eight, yeah. 88 is a while ago. You're a young man. So that brings you pretty young. But what would have been your very first job? The first thing that got you out of the house, even if it's collecting baseball cards or make, making a lemonade stand, just whatever it was that got you started in mm -hmm. your path of work. So the first thing I did was a paper route. Mm -hmm. And that would have been the summer. Like I think it was between grade six and seven. But I wasn't long at it. It was um, really the next year I, 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 I got a camera. What happened, we went on a school trip to Ottawa and uh, we all had little cameras, you know, mm -hmm. 110 cameras in those days. And um, just for some reason or another, my pictures were better than the other kids, which was tremendously encouraging for me because I wasn't good at sports. I didn't play hockey. I didn't do the Canadian things. And now I had something that made me feel special. And uh, when, when the pictures came back and we all looked at them, um, the teachers all gathered the other teachers in the room to show them mine. Now, not that they were that fantastic, but I had a, a sense of composition and clarity that the other kids and a lot of the teachers didn't have. So I had a thing and it was like the next year I started taking pictures of horses because we had race horses mm -hmm. and I was selling them to the owners. So literally that was like the first, aside from the paper route, the first real job I had was all kind of an entrepreneurial thing. So I started in 1980, I guess, if you count that. In 80. Did you get any other jobs along the way, say in middle school and high school sure. that kind of earned some money? Yeah. Yeah. I loved selling. Uh, I loved fashion. And I loved uh, working in clothing stores. I, I loved, you know, working in malls and things like that. I thought that was the coolest job ever. All the girls were there. Uh, you got to dress up and look your best every day. And I, I was always a people person. Sales were came natural to me. Before we get too far ahead, say after high school, is there something? It's a new question because I, I was listening to a guy and he just mentioned the idea of play. And play is an obvious thing that everyone should do even as we get older but play is a really good part of our development is there something that you did as a kid in your play that you really enjoyed that just it just got you out of whatever was going on in your life sure absolutely race horses we had horses so we raced it was harness racing you know with the sulkies and mm -hmm. uh from the time I got in junior high, I, I looked after horses and I took pictures of horses. I wrote for a newspaper about horses and that was my play. So uh, <clears throat> sometimes a little too much playing with it. Didn't do that well in school unless I was, because uh, I was focused on too many things. But um, yeah, it was the horses that really kind of pulled me out. They're such beautiful creatures, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And there was a, uh, there was an excitement with the horse racing, you know, there was an excitement if you're, if you're 12 years old and you know, you're, you're, you're wanting to get out of, there was five of us kids. I wanted to get out with my dad. I wanted to be with the men. Mm -hmm. And uh, I loved going on the track with my dad and uh, kind of, you know, you're, you're leaving your mother then sort of, you know, you're, you're not the little boy anymore. And I, it, it, it helped me grow up. 
as some people know that you're in Cape Breton and you and I were talking a moment ago, my uncle Ian has a barn full of horses and his father, my grandfather Earl raced horses as well. And it's just always something that I wanted to have my own horse or, you know, be at least close to something where I could at least participate, help and get my hands dirty and get in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was a big part of my life and uh, got me started in this industry aside from working in the malls. Um, I sold life insurance briefly, but uh I had a kind of a, a turning point in my life. I was 19. I was a heavy drinker. I was getting into all sorts of trouble. I was living in Halifax then and uh, came to a point where I was in a detox and doing things like that. And uh, I had to get sober. So, is this after high school? Yeah, this is only a couple of years after high school. Before um, I, getting into that, though, were, what were you thinking you wanted to do? Did you have um, an idea as you were yeah, here in I graduation? Always, I always thought I'd be in business. I thought mm -hmm. maybe I could um, have a men's clothing store or something like that. I really didn't think I would have a photography studio. It was always a side gig to me. Um, I don't think I ever really thought of it as a profession, ever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And after I got sober... Um, I was, you know, I was unemployed. I lost my job with the insurance company. They, uh, they had let me go. And uh, somebody suggested um, that there was a little film store downtown here. And uh, they said, the guy needs help. And I wasn't working. He said, would you give him a hand? And, uh, you know, he would pay me a few bucks. So I went in there, found out he was closing out. And really in a, in a, in a quick turn of events within three months, I had, I got a little loan from a, you know, one of those government agencies that helps young entrepreneurs. I got a startup and I, I was in business three months later. Isn't it funny? You and I were talking again, I said, and mentioning the hardships we have, the difficulties we have, and maybe you might want to get into that. But isn't that funny how that worked out for you at that point? to where you are now and you know you're coming over a hump not sure what you want to do and then i was like hey there's a guy over there he needs some help with photography and 30, yeah. 30 years later this is what you're doing yeah. it's funny because we we worry and we're concerned and we think oh no it's not going to work out but it always does yeah and uh and, and really you know I, I i have to thank god for that and face that because at that point, when I was getting sober, I had really like had come down to nothing. Like I had lost my job, uh, I had lost. I got kicked out of where I was living. I was engaged to be married. That was over, and uh, I was kind of down and out. And I became very open to what God might have in store for me because I was, you know, I was screwing things up. So I became um, became somebody who said yes to suggestions. If somebody was trying to help me, the stubbornness left me. And that was, it was just a matter of that, you know, like the guy needs help. Would you give him a hand? Prior to that, I found out about the, uh, the film store needing help because I was volunteering at the hospital. I was taking around the books to the patients because I was sitting in Tim Hortons one day and I said, you know, I feel guilty. I'm not working. I've never not worked. You know, I was always a worker and I was getting kind of down on myself. And one of the guys says, look, why don't you volunteer at the hospital? I hear they're looking for people. So I said yes to that. That brought me to the lady that was working there. She said, oh, my husband has a film store. Would you like mm. to? And really, that's how it happened. It was a series of yeses. Yes to God, really, I felt I was saying yes to. So when you started, you got your loan, you started your business, and there's probably some ups and downs along the way. But basically well, from many, nine, many 1993 of owning your own business and up until 2017, that's a pretty good career right there, but you kind of came upon some other difficulties. What was that and how did that transpire for you and what was going through your mind? Well, the first studio was more of a one hour photo lab in 88. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, you know, you, you bring your film in, you get them out in an hour and uh, that kind of business at that time was starting to go out. Walmart was getting into it and the supermarkets, they were, using film developing as a loss leader. And uh, we just couldn't keep up. We, we couldn't mm. compete with their prices. I did have a little studio in the back 
of that one hour photo lab so that I was taking pictures, but really the main business model was the photo lab. So I ended up going bankrupt in 1991. I hung on as long as I could, but I was in all kinds of debt and uh, I wasn't able to dig my way out of it. So again, you know, I was down and out. And I went to Alberta because there was a little transition between 91 and 93 when I opened the business. So I went to Alberta to, to think and to, to be away. I worked for a newspaper up there and, and just report it in a small town, Alberta. Northern, Northern Alberta was high level. So I worked there and uh, I always kind of felt uh, kind of a desire or a curiosity about priesthood. And I thought this is a good time in my life to do it. If I'm gonna do it, I better do it now. And uh, so I went to Ottawa and I was with a religious community for, for two years. And uh, at the end of that two years, it was gonna be my year to go to seminary. And although I had a great experience there, I have nothing, no complaints. Some of my best friends are still there. I felt, you know, I don't think God's calling me to be a priest. And I just had this inclination, I was gonna come home and open the business. So that's what I did. So through the nineties, I, you know, struggled along, you know, it's hard when you're starting out. And, and I started to join the professional associations because um, I thought if you're going to be successful, the best way to do it is look around at other successful people mm -hmm. and copy them. So it's really, that's kind of how I did it. I started to travel, you know, go to the maritime conventions and I would go to the Canadian ones and you make it, every time I came back from a convention, my business would double because I would have all these great ideas from successful people on how to do it right. Mm -hmm. And then I would travel to the States and, and uh, yeah, I had a school business in the beginning, Brian. So I was doing like school pictures and had built a big business and probably, I think it was around 2002, I had to make a choice whether I'm gonna be a school photographer or I'm gonna be a studio photographer, more of an artistic kind. And I picked the latter. So that was a struggle. As, as you approached 2017, how, how were those struggles mounting for you? What was, what was the issue? What was the rub? Okay. So through the 2000s, um, started the getting serious about doing portrait photography and things took off. I had great success through, you know, 2004, five, six, seven, eight. Um, I was on the speaking circuit, so I, I spoke in Europe at conventions. I spoke down in the States, California, all over Canada. I did a Canadian tour one summer, you know, just a speaking tour, and then people would come and hear your seminar. So, as, you know, it was, a, it was a bit of a rock star photographer life in a sense. Mm -hmm. But then we hit that recession in 2000, late 2008 mm -hmm. and 2009. And my mistake, Brian, was... Uh, I was running so fast, I wasn't really watching what was happening. And I was running a little too close to the edge. So everything I was taking in, I was blowing out either in, in staff expenses, advertising budgets, uh, you know, new gear. Like there was no, there was nothing I didn't say yes to if I wanted to do something in my business. I, I, I had no limits on what I was going to do. I didn't spend a lot personally. I didn't have a lavish life, lived in a small house. Didn't spend much that way. It was always single, but um, yeah. So when that recession hit, it hit hard. And I was still on the speaking circuit. So I would fly out every Sunday morning, it seemed. Um, maybe finish your wedding Saturday night, get home at three in the morning, shower and go to the airport because I had to fly out on a 5 a.m. flight. Maybe fly out to British Columbia or to California, teach for a couple of days, not get back until Wednesday. And then only have you know, Thursday, Friday, maybe Saturday here in the studio if you weren't doing a wedding. And I wasn't watching my business and there started to be, we started to go in the red. So I was paying out more than I was taking in. So that speaking tour didn't really pay that much because uh, it had already been booked the year before, mm -hmm. but the crowd were down. That was during that recession. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. yeah. but 2009, 2010, everything just shrunk. It was horrible. So for you, you came to the end of your rope thinking that what were you going to do instead? What, what were your, your options? Well, I, I kept trying to fix it 2012, 13, 14. 
but just getting more depressed, more negative. And, you know, funny thing, all the things I did to be successful, Brian, was the traveling around, the, uh, you know, taking advice from the experts. I'd stopped the traveling because I felt I can't afford it. I felt like a hypocrite. I didn't want to speak anymore. So I was off the speaking circuit. And I just got into a, a bit of a funk and I thought, I can't make this out. The business changed and um, it was good. I got humbled in a lot of ways. Mm. It, was, it was humiliating. At one point, I moved in with my dad, rented my house out. We're 45 years old, you got to go home and live with your father in the spare room and, uh, you know, rent your house out. It was, it, it was tough. And the other bad part was I became very negative, very jaded. It was almost like a marriage, Brian, you know, marriage is going great. You're in your honeymoon stage. And then you hit, mm. you hit a speed bump and I didn't handle it well. And I thought, oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. It was 2017. My father had died in 2016. So that was a bad year. Cause you know, you spend a lot of time in the hospital and you're not, you're not in entrepreneurial mode. So that was the following year. And I thought, you know what, I'm done. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do. I did think, you know, maybe I could back, go back and work for the Catholic Church somehow. Uh, made some inquiries. I thought maybe I could move to Ontario to do it. So I was ready to go. I was really ready to leave it. And then I went on an eight-day silent retreat because I thought, if I'm going to make a big life decision, I better pray about it. And especially if I was thinking about working for the church or I was even willing to go back to seminary, you know, I was, mm -hmm. I was still single and anything but what I was doing. And a funny thing happened, Brian, at the end of that eight day silent retreat, uh, I thought God was going to have this yellow brick road, this new opportunity. It was going to become so clear to me. I was going to do a, a totally new career path, maybe work for the church. And at the end of the retreat, I felt him saying two things. The first one was, I want you to go back to work and fix this. And I knew that had to be God's voice because that wasn't the one I wanted to hear. And the other one was that it was great that I made eight days of quiet to listen. And not that I never prayed. I prayed all my life and tried to, you know, I was always a, a mass going, you know, you know, Catholic guy that uh, just tried his best. But I didn't have lots of time to sit and listen to what God was saying to me. And I felt him saying, you know, if you go back and fix this, if you give me a little piece of you every day, I can help you. And when I came back, I kind of made a commitment, you know, that uh, every night I was going to take an hour after work. And I had keys to the church because I was good friends with the parish priest. And I said, do you mind if I slip in there at night? Because I'm somebody, I'm very... ADHD, Brian, I, I have to have, a, if I, if I work out, I have to go to the gym to work out. I'm not going to work out at home. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to pray at home the same way I pray in the dark church all alone because there's nothing else to do there. So through that fall, that was, I came home in August and through the fall, you know, it wasn't the business that had to change. It was me that had to change. And uh, slowly but surely I started to open up to ideas and and uh, I felt like he was really guiding me. And that January, I went to Nashville to the big convention again, the first time I went in a while. And uh, I just stumbled upon this business coach there that took a liking to me. And I can't say enough for that guy, Steve Saparito is his name. He, he, he pulled a, he pulled, you know, what's that uh, fable where the, the mouse pulls the pin out of the lion's paw? Mm-hmm grateful that's what this guy did for me you know in a, in, a, in a lot of ways he kind of saved my life he gave me a, a new purpose in business how did he do that what what was it that he did maybe in particular or maybe in subtle ways that kind of gave you a new leaf on life or a lease on life great question because uh i met him in the uh in the in the booth you know they have a trade show so sitting in the booth with an album company i was dealing with it, and they said Oh, meet this guy, Steve Saperito. They said he will change your life. Go to his seminar. And you know, I've heard that a hundred times. Every, every, every new speaker is going to change your life. I used to be one of those guys, you know? So I didn't really want to listen to him. And uh, he started to talk to me. And I can tell you, I was wanting to get out of the booth and just kind of like, okay, nice to meet you. See you later. And he kept, as I was walking out, he kept cutting me off. 
and uh, engaging me and asking me why I was frustrated and, and what had happened. And he said, you stopped caring. You stopped caring about your clients and you stopped caring about the people. And I didn't know that. Mm. Uh, I didn't realize that happened. And he said, why did you stop caring? And I told him, you know, the story about how down things went. And, and I said, how could you help me? And he said, pretend you're a customer and you're calling me to get a portrait done. And we're still in the booth. And, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to play along. And uh, I pretend <laughs> call him, he answers. And he said, what do you want to get a picture of? Now, I'm not married. I didn't have any family. And I said, I don't know. I said, my, my work staff, I had two on staff. And he said, great, start telling me about them. And uh, I had Courtney and Meg Megan. And I told them a little bit about what they were like. They were kind, you know, very giving people. And I was telling the truth. And he said, tell me a story about Courtney. And that year, Courtney, uh, 35 years old, went home, found her husband on the floor dead. Big, you know, traumatic thing for her. Um, she was only off a month and she came back to work. And I was turning 50 a few months later. And as I was approaching the, uh, the birthday, this was a year that you wouldn't think she would do any planning, but she planned a big surprise party for me. She had half the restaurant all there waiting for me. And uh, I just couldn't believe she did that for me, you know? Cause that to me was like, I'm gonna cry talking about it. It was like one of the kindest things cause she was not in a headspace to care about other people. And she still did. And it humbled me. And when I started to from that story, I started to break down. Cause I realized two things. I realized like one, I have a good staff. Like Courtney was at that time was with me about 16 years. And uh, I loved her. Like she was just so, I was so, I just knew I was so lucky to have her. And the same with Megan, she wasn't there as long. And he said to me, how much is that picture worth to you now? And I couldn't put a price on it. Like I knew I just, when I got back, I had to have a photo of those girls because they were so mm. important. And he said, I just did that for you in five minutes. He said, why can't you do that for your clients? You know, and he it was just the way he layered the questions and cared about the people that changed me. And it changed the way I, I dealt with my clients again. And uh, so now when someone calls us or, wants to get a picture done here. We're not asking, you know, yes, I got to get your name and address, but I want to know, you know, what's your, what's your graduate like? You know, mm. what's the thing you admire most about him? What's the thing you see in him that you wish you had yourself when you were that age? And you just start getting people to open up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've seen people in here say things to each other that they've never said. I was doing a, a session with a couple um, they were probably in their fifties, married for at least 20 years. It wasn't, it was, yeah, it was the 25th wedding anniversary. That's what it was. And I start to ask those questions. And especially if you ask a guy, cause most of the time guys don't get asked. And I just got to decline a phone call there. Sorry. Um, and, and anyway, he got asked, I got asked some of these questions and he said things about his wife that made his wife blush and cry right in front of me. She had never heard them. So not only, and she probably said to me afterwards that, that this changed, this changed the relationship and, uh, and just the relationship took a whole new turn after that. So, I mean, it's just an incredible thing we can do. And the business did change, you know, I got out of my, uh, I got out of my funk. I started to serve people in a different way. So instead of thinking about it as a business, I really just thought this is, this is a way I can serve people and uh, help the relationships. And, you know, it, it's paid off. So over the last three years or so, you've seen a dramatic change, not only in your business and the bottom line, but in the way you approach Absolutely. The people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a renewed purpose. You know, one of the things I always loved about priesthood was the opportunity to minister and care about people. But I had become so jaded that mm. I, I wasn't able to do that anymore. And he reawakened that in me. And uh, it, gave, it gave me a new purpose, you know. 
I think any any of us, Brian, we're we're, we're made in our lives to uh, to love and mm-hmm. to receive it and to give it and all that kind of stuff. Sounds kind of yeah. kind of cliche, but it, it it's really sure. true. Yeah, I mean, that's what else is there? To serve, and, uh, yeah. And to serve, and he just, he gave that back to me. And uh, not only gave it back to me, I never really had it as deeply as I did uh, with what he was able to, you know, he made me realize that I, I could still minister in a sense uh, with what I'm doing. And I didn't have to be a, a man of the cloth or something like that, you know, I can do it right where I'm at. It's been great. Absolutely. What is what does a week look like for you now? Now that things are a little bit different, you I think you you've come to a different level in the way you handle or approach your work. What does it look like for you now? Maybe the the speaking engagements are on or off, but what do you do on a regular basis? Well, there's no speaking engagements. I I would like to go back, um, mm-hmm. especially you know once things start opening up because I feel I have something to offer again. Uh, I got all the, I had seven credit cards maxed out for almost 10 years. They're paid off. My back taxes paid off. So I had worked probably 80 to 100 hours a week for the last few years trying to fix this thing. What I have to do now, Brian, is to work smarter and not as hard. So it's a hard transition when you're used to go, go, go. Uh, but I have to delegate some more responsibilities. I have a great staff. I have a new lady, Jody's her name. Um, she's the one who takes all the phone calls now. I don't, I don't do that part anymore. I do it when they get in here, but she really opens them up on the phone and she's been great at it. So I have to delegate more because there's only so much of you to go around. And, uh, you know, I can't keep going. I'm 53. I can't keep going at uh, 80, 90, 100 hour work weeks. Oh, forever. you're a young pup yet. <laughs> you have a beautiful studio there behind you. I mean, I can't imagine going from if you think in 1988 when you had some little place, a little studio yeah. on the back compared to what you seem to have now. It seems great. I know in Korea here, there's lots of studios, but they're really small, right? They'll have like a little, maybe a desk or a, a checkout yeah. in the front. And then just this little room that's maybe even just mapped off by a piece of fabric. But right. I mean, what you have going there seems incredible. That's a nice- 4,000 square feet. Yeah, no, I'm very, very fortunate. Yeah, I'm very blessed right now. Very lucky. What is the difference, say, when you first started photography between photography itself? What, what are some of the differences? But what are some things that has remained the same? You know, good work will always be good work. The, the, when I started, we started, of course, on film. You couldn't see what you were doing. Now, at one point, I got uh, a medium, what they call a medium format camera, and you would do sometimes a Polaroid of your light setup. But you really, we read light, and I got to understand what lighting was, what good lighting was, and uh, I was competing in the competitions and, you know, earning my masters. That's still important. Now, a lot of the newer photographers today, uh, they shoot window light, they shoot outside. It's kind of very flat. It's a nice look but it's really done and there's not many of the old school guys like me left that 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 create dramatic lighting or create a mood with light rather than just this blanket light that you see out there so good work is always good work and that's always remained the same and your relationship with people uh has to be strong so that's remained the same in fact it's probably gotten better for people who are getting into this industry, is there a skill that is necessary even to put your foot into it or something that you have to continually develop for you to be a professional? Is, is there a particular skill that one needs? Yeah, I would say if you are um, interested in photography, most of the people I know have a sense of the beautiful and have a sense of composition. You can always expand on that. But, but but the photographers I know that have been sexual, successful, they, they, we can tell when something or someone looks nice. An angle, uh, the way the light's hitting their face, that just speaks to us in a different way. Now, you can build on that. But if you don't have that interest, I can't see this being a very interesting or successful endeavor for you. I think that's kind of the thing. It has to be an artistic 
thing in you somewhere. Is there a, a particular a particular tool, a favorite thing that you use that you can't be without when you do your work? Other than the camera? Yeah, maybe it's a specific type of camera, which would be way over my head, but this is mm -hmm. you need this tool wherever you go. Not so much. Um, if you gave me one light and uh, even like a, an amateur camera, if I have one good light with me, I can do a lot with that. I can build on that. I can direct the light the way I want. I can create a mood with it. Um, you can reflect it off of things to give you two lights. But if you're just using a big window behind you, it's just that one thing. Mm -hmm. And it's the one thing that everybody can do. It doesn't set you apart. So yeah, one light, it can even be, it can be a flashlight if it had to be. Well, it's, it's good that you say that because there may be some people out there thinking, well, I need to buy this most expensive camera. I need to buy yeah. these particular lights. Uh, and they're trying to tell someone, like tell their mom, mom, I really need this. No, John says, all you need is a flashlight and your hand phone. And well, you can make good pitch. <laughs> As it, an example, that you don't need to go out and do this to at least don't. start. It took me um, until a few years ago before I really updated my equipment because, you know, I was having a hard time. The lights I was using um, were from the 90s, so they weren't reliable. They were failing on me a lot. It was very frustrating. Uh, I would be in the middle of a shoot, maybe a, a big shoot outside, fashion shoot, and you got to push the button and it wouldn't work. And, and I'm telling you, I used to take my gear and throw it. I get so <laughs> <clears throat> and it was one day in here in the studio that that happened and I threw my flash and I thought this is crazy I have to like I was starting to do better but I wasn't out of the woods yet but I thought to myself I'm 50 this year I at least deserve equipment that's going to work mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I just I just got to do this so I went and I uh, got approved for a lease so you could lease equipment and have to buy it because I couldn't I couldn't get a loan I was in bad shape but I got approved for a lease and I updated some of the new fancy flashes, but it took me well, it's like 30 years into it before I did that. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I pretty much, I think there's one more big purchase. I probably spent about 40 grand in the last few years, but I was getting along before that. I was winning awards with the old lights, just that now it's a little more reliable. <laughs> Do you have a, a tip for people thinking of yourself who started as a paper boy? You also worked in fashion or you were selling some pictures of horses and stuff like that, but also you consider changing your career. So do you have a tip for people who are getting into work or thinking about changing their career? Well, you know, I, I, my walk is going to be different. I, 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 God has gotten me out of a lot of jams. And he's done that for me. But the one thing I had, Brian, that I always had is a good work ethic. Mm -hmm. Wasn't afraid of hard work. Wasn't afraid of long hours rolling up my sleeves. And uh, I, I had a, an attitude that, you know, like try to do the job right the first time. So I wasn't somebody that phoned anything in. And even as I got older, like I, I'm less you know, likely to take a shortcut ever. Um, so I had a good, a good work, work ethic. And I knew that you just don't, there's no sense of entitlement with me. Like I, I had to work hard and I expect, I still expect to. It seems almost a Cape Breton thing, but you might have come across a few young teenagers who don't share that same ethic. I don't but... find they these days. No, yeah, um, tough. different generation. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we all grew up a little different, right? But Do I grew up in. Do you, do you have a, an overall goal for your studio or that in particular or something else? Is there something that you like? <laughs> you keep mentioning 50. I don't think you're that old, but you, you might have yourself on a, a, a timeline and thinking, I would like to accomplish this before I finish working. That's a great question. And you know what? I don't have an answer. My goal was when I came back from the retreat was to fix it. Mm -hmm. So that was my short, I couldn't see beyond that because like I was in the red, like I said, I had seven credit cards maxed out uh, all the time and uh, always had to, you know, avoid those dreaded, you know, calls. you look down your phone, you'd see, you know, Canada Revenue Agency. It was never going to be a good call. 
Um, even though I was making payments, they always wanted more. It was very, very stressful. So when I came back from the retreat, my goal was to get out of that. Um, outside of a lottery ticket, I didn't think it was possible. Now, four years later, it's done. So I was like, I have to get a new goal. I didn't think this was ever going to happen. So now I have to, I have to change my approach. So yeah, I do. I am starting to think of, uh, of new goals, things I can do. Maybe I could go back to teaching. I mean, you can teach in a platform with podcasts. Now you could, you could have creative live as us photographers on there. I mean, there's other avenues. I don't have to get on a plane every week and, and do that. But at some point I can't keep working the crazy hours I'm working because you're just going to burn out or you might want to, you know, have a life <laughs> that I haven't had in a while. I do love my work though. It's been very rewarding. So Brian, I need a new goal. You're great. You, you, you brought that question to the forefront. It's something I got to answer for sure. Well, yeah, I mean, but like I said, you have another 25 of working years in you if you yep. so choose, right? So you have a, a while <laughs> and many short-term goals that might get you to a bigger one. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a big one. It's the, it's the next short-term one. It's like, it's this year to, uh, continue on the road I'm on and uh, maybe try to work a little bit less, just a little bit. Is there anything people may not understand about you and that if they understood this, they would have a better appreciation of what you're trying to do, but also maybe not understanding photography in particular, because I could imagine you wouldn't want to say anything bad about clients, but it's not always easy, right? I can imagine if I went to a photographer and I got pictures, then, you know, I might, I don't like this. I don't like what you did. And then you get lots of things that might not be as pleasurable. So do you have something people may not understand about you or the industry that if they understood this, they would have a better appreciation of your work? A great question. So it's like almost there's two questions to unpack there. Um, I, I think if people understood, and I, and I kind of think do, people do get it, that um, I'm very much, uh, I have a servant's heart. And if somebody's not pleased with something, I'm going to go really out of my way. Except there, you're never going to please everybody. And there's things I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make mistakes. Um, there's, a, there's one this week that uh, somebody wasn't pleased with uh, a photograph. So, you know, I'm on to that person every day. I'm, I'm, I'm going to see it through. I don't take it as personal as I used to. But before, when I was younger, I certainly would take it personal and maybe have hurt feelings or, or even be defensive. But um, you know what? Now it's, I'm not as big a deal as I used to think I was. <laughs> it must be a little heartbreaking too, to have a servant's heart. I mean, we're a fallen creature who are not perfect and we do right. take it a little bit you know, closer to heart than we would yep. like. So if we're a servant and we're trying to serve and someone doesn't like it, it kind of, besides the defensive part, it's a little heartbreaking. Like I'm really trying, I want this to be the best work that I've ever done for you. And if you don't like it, that hurts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've, I've gotten over it. There's always a way to fix something. I haven't had anybody walk away, at least that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. angry or upset. Most of the time I've heard, I really appreciate you getting right on this for me. If somebody has a problem, like you got to get on that right away. It's not something you got, you can avoid. Uh, and you, you want to do whatever you can. You want to show them that, Hey, I'm going to do whatever I can to, to fix this for you. And uh, I, I don't know. I find most people very appreciative mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and very responsive to it. I, I think they can tell, you know, they can tell that I'm, that I care. Well, you're making them look beautiful too. I mean, they are beautiful anyway, but you're, you're helping them. Like, how can they complain? Like, that looks pretty good, you know, especially if they look better. <laughs> like, yeah, there's not, there's not that much negative feedback, but I mean, like I say, you're, you're never going to, you're not going to hit a home run every time you go to bat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I only have a couple more questions for you, John. Is there any, you mentioned some ups and downs, some bumps along the way. Is there any particular adversity that you had faced that either hinders you in your work, but motivates you as well to keep going. It might even pull you back sometimes, but just something that you can use to encourage others in their work. Um, yeah, when it does get dark and you do get down, you know what, the, the sun rises the next day. Uh, I don't ever, uh, 
I don't ever worry like I used to. I think COVID kind of fixed that too, Brian, because when COVID happened, uh, I thought maybe this will be it. Maybe this will be the end. Uh, I still wasn't really out of the woods and I didn't know what was going to happen. So I really, really learned to live, you know, I just live a day at a time. Uh, when you can just deal with what you have for the day and you can handle anything, it was all the worry I used to carry about what's going to happen with this or what's going to happen with that. When it looked like it was going to go down the tubes and it took the worry away, it actually freed me up and uh, it changed my, my outlook. So, you know, I know the sun's going to rise tomorrow. Whatever you're dealing with today is not going to be as bad tomorrow. Sometimes a night's sleep fix, fixes things. Mm -hmm. So I became very, uh, I, I, it helped me to live a day at a time, which is really what we should be doing anyway. Sometimes a nap helps. Uh, you know what? Sometimes a <laughs> sleep. <laughs> a little just a little five minute nap and then things yeah. seem a little bit different it, it holds us back from reacting right whatever the situation is if you're feeling a little gloomy your your mindset is the way it is in this particular situation just that one little step in a different direction just changes it it doesn't make everything roses and rainbows and all of those other things but it Thank does you. change it it just gives you this reprieve of feeling that particular feeling at that moment yeah. And you know, like it really, like I said, I don't know how much you talk about faith on your podcast, but uh, I, I can't say enough for that. It was really, it's really that last hour of my night when I, when I go to have quiet time with God, you know, I say some prayers for other people and intercede and, and do some other things while I'm there, read some scripture, but I really try to take that quiet. And at the end of the quiet, I go through my day and, and do kind of a, an inventory, like a nightly examine. You know, where have I gone wrong today? Where have I gone right? What can I do about it tomorrow? That's really, that reshuffles the deck for you. Mm, so that absolutely. You know, you're ready to play again the next day. I never go to bed with that, that dark feeling. Yeah, I, I don't talk about faith a lot only because I allow my guests to do it. So you're mentioning sure. it. So I'm a Christian and I believe everything is a <laughs> wonderful gift of grace. And, and I, you know, without that and forgiveness we're doomed <laughs> no <that's laughs> right and a lot of people who may do things to us that's usually where our, our troubles come from or we're making mistakes or making the wrong so forgiving you know putting our, our faith in christ is is uh -huh. that is the that's the only way that i know of that is uh that works do you have I mean, any you go ahead i was just gonna say um you know, he says, love your enemies. When somebody he does something, I remember a few years ago, somebody was really upset with me and was very hard on me. And uh, I could have reacted negatively. To, I could have carried it. But I, you know what? I just made a decision. I prayed for that person sometimes multiple times a day, whether I felt like it or not. And, and to be honest, I didn't feel like it mm. in the beginning. But as I got doing that, um, you know, God was able to sh open my eyes a little bit to see, you know, this person reacted this way because that person's a hurt person and they misunderstood something you did. There's nothing you can do about that, but it, it kind of, it eased things up. And um, yeah, I wasn't, I, I didn't have to carry it and I even understand it, you know? So I've never really been someone to carry a lot of resentments. I, I attack them right away. Like I said, it's just you start praying for the enemy. Yeah, it's, it's always in a way. Always that adage of people who hold resentment towards other people, and those people aren't even thinking about them. No, <laughs> be like, oh, they've done me all the negative. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it, it, when you do that too, another good thing happens is, uh, and I, you know, as I'm getting older, I really hope that continues to happen for me. You know, I, I understand my own fallen nature. You know, I'm not perfect. I, you know, I have a lot of my own issues that, uh, but if you're, if, when I was always focused on other people's, you know, wrong or blaming other people for what was happening to me, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't see myself in it mm -hmm. because you're deflecting everything, you know, mm -hmm. but, but when you, when you pray for that other person, the Lord gets in your heart and he starts to say, Hey, you know, I was, there's a t-shirt I want to get. And it says, just simply says, most things are my fault <laughs> because most things that went wrong in my life in some way, shape or form 
were my fault, either by the way I reacted to them, or I often did something to create the situation in the first place. So it took a lot of the power of, of negative things away and put it back on me. John, is there anything else that we haven't touched upon that you'd like to add? Any other words of wisdom? I think it's been a great conversation. But is there anything, anything yeah. else you'd like um, to add? You know, if you stay at the table long enough, the chips come back to you. <laughs> because I went to the trustees mm. four or five times in the last decade, you know, thinking about going bankrupt and uh, giving up. And it was always that one little voice in my head, you know, like, and I always say to them, let me try one more year. And they were always saying, you should do this now. You know, you can start back up in business again. But, you know, I felt kind of a moral responsibility for the mess I created. And I always said, just let me try one, one more time. So, I mean, if you stick with something long enough, uh, and that goes through with marriages or whatever, you know, and there's some you got to get out of, I get that. But I learned a lot about myself through this. I wouldn't have changed it. Um, I probably would have been, you know, when I was on the speaking circuit, and living the rock star uh, life, it, it was a there was a lot of self indulgence, and, and, and maybe if that continued, I would have been a cocky little sob. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but it humbled me out, and uh, I would rather be who I am now through that. So I think it was Henry Winkler. You know who he is, the Fonz. Yes. From Happy Days. I don't know how old you are, but anyway. No, I, I remember. Like, Chachi. Okay. I call I call all my all kids Chachi. Is okay. That, they, is that the right? Yeah, yeah. So the Fonz was a star in it, and he was a big TV star in the seventies. Henry mm -hmm. Winkler. Mm -hmm. Fast forward only a few years ago, he wins his second Emmy. Since the first one, I think, was in nineteen seventy three or four. His second one is in two thousand seventeen or eighteen. I think it was eighteen for a role he has in a show called Barry. And when he got up to give his speech. Uh, he was just kind of making light of it, you know, how many years. And then he was being interviewed afterwards. And he said that if you stay at the table long enough, the chips come back to you. Yeah. And I, I grabbed on and I related to that because I felt the same way. You know, like I, you know, I stayed in the game long enough and uh, now the chips are back. It could, it could be gone again. Who knows? Certainly. Yeah. If you're not in the game, you're certainly not going to win. If you're not in the game. You can't, you, you don't have a chance. How can people reach you? How can they get in contact with you for work, for uh, getting some of that uh, photography for themselves? Uh, other than calling our, our number, 902-794-8880, most people tend to reach out through social media. So we're on Instagram as Ratchford Studios. Um, Facebook is Ratchford Studios. They seem to be the two main platforms that I find that people are getting in touch with me. I'm building a new website, so... Uh, is, it'll be ratchetphotographic.com, but uh, I'm in the middle of building a new one. So it will be what again? Sorry, ratchetphotographic.com. Perfect. One final question, sir. Sure. Why do you work? Why do I work? I think we're created to work. Um, I get a lot of joy out of this. Uh, aside from, you know, we have to work, but it gives us a sense of purpose and a sense of well being. The times, the brief times in my life that I didn't work, I, did, I felt like a bum. And I think inside of us all, I mean, there's going to be things that you maybe you get sick and you can't work. But when we can't be productive as people, and uh, especially, and I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, it's different for men than women, but when women have kids or, or families, a lot of their time is devoted there. But when men can't produce and provide, I think it's very hard on us. It's crippling. It's crippling. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So I don't know. I think that's why I work. John Radford, owner and operator of Radford Photographic Studio. Thank you for your time, sir. And I appreciate the work that you do. Well, thank you, Brian. I appreciate the work that you do. It was great talking to you. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Thank you to John Radford and get to him if you're in the area, get some photos done by him. And check them out on social media. As for me, find me on any podcast host, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, any of the other smaller ones as well. Uh, for YouTube, subscribe, share, hit the notification button, comment. 
And if you or you know someone would make a good guest and you'd like to be on, uh, email me at whyweworkbrianv at gmail.com. The V is V-E-E. whyweworkbrianv at gmail.com. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work.